If that is true, those yellow bars don't exist. And I would add that they're saying a minimum of 100 million overcount. It could be significantly worse. We just don't know. The Chinese economic model also ends this decade. Now, they'll probably last a little bit longer than the Germans will. But I would not plant, make a lot of long-term orders for Chinese gear. Unless you just like, you know, Reno or something. In which case, go for it. Uh, we need to figure out how to get by without either the Germans or the Chinese. And that basically means doubling the size of the industrial plant in the United States as quickly as is feasibly possible in an era of constrained capital and labor. Inflation, inflation, inflation. There's a partial patch south of the border. Uh, our Mexican partners have the healthiest demography, not just in the rich world, but in the advanced developing world as well. But I will point out, because this is a group that deals with electricity, and I, I know you import a lot of Mexicans for this, check out how it drops. This is when NAFTA was ratified 30 years ago, and then it just dropped straight down. They started the same industrialization, urbanization trend of the rest of the world just later. Now, this is not a terminal demography by any stretch of the imagination, but it does mean we need to start thinking of Mexicans in a way that we're not used to in this country. They're a precious resource is limited in supply. Net migration from Mexico to the U.S. has now been negative for 12 of the last 13 years. It'll probably never be positive again. And we're not the only ones who need to double the size of our industrial plant. Mexicans are taking Mexican jobs in Mexico because they can. We're kind of in a box, just like everybody else. It's still great from a manufacturing point of view, though. Here are labor costs in Southeast Asia. Here are our Mexican neighbors, hyper-competitive. And here are the Chinese. Mexican labor is now one-third the cost of Chinese labor and more highly skilled. That's a delta that's never going to close. All right, final slide. Let me give you the nut. Here's inflation in the United States and Canada. Brother economies, very similar. Our numbers track as you would expect. Three big phases for inflation in the post-World War II era. First, the original globalization push, the original industrialization push. We run power lines in the countryside. We build skyscrapers. We build interstate highways. Industrial demand-driven inflation. You only have to do that once, luckily. Second, the baby boomers come of age. They move into the suburbs. They have kids. They buy cars and homes. Consumer demand-driven inflation. And then we got this weird period that we all think of as normal. The Chinese entered the global economy, dumped a billion workers onto the workforce. Manufactured good prices go into a sharp deflationary spiral. The Russian system collapses, the Soviet system collapses, and an empire worth of raw materials is dumped onto global markets, keeping commodity prices under control. All the inflationary trends of the last 75 years are back, and all of the disinflationary ones have flipped. We need to double the size of our industrial plant. It's going to look just like the 50s. The baby boomers may be retiring, but the millennials are at their peak of consumption and will be for another decade. That's a repeat of the 80s. Russian materials are going away. Chinese labor is going away. We are looking at 9 to 15% inflation per year for a minimum of the next five until such time as we double our industrial plant and we've rebuilt, rebuilt our manufacturing supply chains closer to home in a more sustainable, lower-cost manner. If we do that, then at some point in 2027, 2028, we exit this inflationary period and we have a much more stable price structure going forward. If we fail to double the size of the industrial plant, that 9 to 15% range sticks, and we have product shortages of every type. So the question is, where are you guys going to buy your crap from? <laughs> because if you're going to bet on the Chinese and the Germans, this is our new normal but it doesn't have to be. Oh, I forgot one more thing. I promised you pricing data for natural gas. 
with the new stuff that is coming online in places like the Haynesville and the Fayetteville, we're probably going to have a functional floor of four and a half and a functional ceiling about seven, seven and a half. I think that's where this is going to ultimately equal out. Whether you find that you know delightful or horrific is, of course, up to you. So the refining industry is absolutely losing their minds over this because they were designed to run on heavy, sour crude that was imported primarily from Canada until recently Venezuela. So they take the low-end crude from the rest of the world, they bring it into their high-end refineries, they turn it into finished product, and then sell that at top dollar globally. That probably won't work for them in an oil export ban environment. They're going to be swamped with light sweep that's produced from the shale fields. So they're going to have to basically add two, three million barrels of new refining capacity very, very quickly. But once that's done, they will have their old and they will have their new and they will be able to do both business lines and they will be the fastest growing sector in the world. So they're going to early and celebrate later. <laughs> Everyone has to go through that thought process. So if you happen to be in Arizona, it's difficult for you to get natural gas. It's difficult for you to get oil. You will probably be one of the places that sees higher petroleum costs, but you're also in Sun Central. So the balance of costs for energy, for natural gas versus oil versus refined product versus green tech, the balances we've all planned on, those are going to change, but that it's going to change differently in every part of the country. There was a bit of a, um, a reckoning in Japan and in Europe when the Russians moved into Ukraine, and they realized that even if the Americans do continue to hold up the ceiling for everyone from a security point of view, that the game really is on and things need to be done differently. Which means that they looked at their demographics and they looked at their trade balance and they all came to the same conclusion that without the United States as part of the game, dominant part of the game, their economies don't function. And so they basically sub what's the word I'm looking for? subsumed their currency policies into the US dollar and they're now basically adjuncts of the US dollar system. Canada was already there, Mexico was already there, the Australians and the Kiwis were already there. And now all the hard currencies of the world are basically following the Fed when it comes to currency policy, which means that the U.S. dollar has nowhere to go but up for at least the next 30 years. It won't necessarily go up in a straight line, uh, but even the Chinese, who are always concerned about whatever the Americans are going to do and the power that gives them, they still use SWIFT. Their Chinese system for payment rationale uses SWIFT. Uh, and when the... Russians decided to switch a lot of stuff over to Yuan to stick it to the US. They discovered there's no liquidity in that market. And so all that money is gone. It's in Yuan that they can't use. So everyone has kind of done what they always do. Like, oh, anything but the dollar. And they get to something that's not the dollar. Like, holy crap, this is useless. And they go back to the dollar. And since we've got demographic collapse in Japan 